out of town to come here. It's a vast majority. How many of you have come by train? About half. Okay. Um, the, uh, the reason I'm asking you that is because I guess this is a session where traditional media, the media meet the shock of the new. And most of you will know that um, the business school is next to the train station, because some of you came by train. What a lot of you won't know is that if you turn out of the business school and walk about 150 yards down the road, you'll come to something called the Oxford Canal. And the Oxford Canal was opened on the 1st of January 1790. And when it was opened, there was a great sort of parade in Oxford and great celebration, because the Oxford Canal meant for the first time coal could come to Oxford and be unloaded in Oxford from the Midlands. And the pathway that coal came to Oxford is it used to come round by sea, down the east coast of England, into London, and up the Thames to Oxford. So clearly getting coal from the Midlands down the canal was a lot better. Um, but of course, the people who used to transport the coal by sea protested. And there was a big battle. And eventually, the sea coalers gave up. And um, the canal was opened. And it brought coal to Oxford from the Midlands. Um, What's the relevance of all this? Well, I guess for some people, gosh, <coughs> for some people, what we're seeing today, where traditional media meets social media and meet user-generated media, is rather like the battle between the um, uh, the sea coalers and the canal men, or um, or between the canals and the steam engine, and inevitably, what we're seeing is we're about to see mainstream media. Yeah, yeah submerged by a wave of social media. And I guess what I think, um, I'm just chairing this session, but what I suspect is that what we're going to see is rather more complex than that. Um, after all, the canal stopped and the railways took over, and the canal basin that used to be here in Oxford, where all that coal was unloaded, um, appropriately enough, was bought in 1937 by Lord Nuffield, who made his money out of cars, paved over, and turned into a car park at a college. Um, so change there was pretty clear. But I guess in the media, we're seeing things that are actually rather more running in parallel, if you like. The VCR hasn't killed the television. Television hasn't killed radio. Um, and uh, we're not all speaking at the moment on video phones. Most of us use some kind of telephone. But I guess there are two problems with that view. Um, the the media is not the canal to the steam engine, but clearly something pretty fundamental is happening. And um, something pr very fundamental is happening. And I guess on the face of it, what we have here is three representatives of the mainstream media, the BBC, Reuters, and the Washington Post. But I guess the reason we have these three is because both as individuals and in terms of their organizations, they're thinking about how one adapts to change so one doesn't end up the way of the people who brought this coal by sea, or indeed of the canal ferries who used to bring the coal to Oxford, down the Oxford Canal. Uh, on my left, we've got Richard Sandbrook, who is director of global news at the BBC, um, and uh, at one stage was in charge of all of BBC news, but is director of global news at the BBC. Richard's um, interesting for many reasons, but one of them is that um, long before any BBC editors had a blog, Richard had his own blog, which is called Sacred Facts, which I recommend to you all, which is um, a worth a visit and worth reading. Um, and the BBC may seem as about as mainstream media organisation as you could imagine, but nevertheless it's an organisation which um, has the most popular content-based site website in Britain and whose business editor has the most popular blog in Britain, as far as I'm aware. John Kelly, who will speak after Richard, uh, is the author of the paper that's sitting in front of you. John's an award-winning columnist on the Washington Post and writes a daily column for the Washington Post Metro edition and also um, writes a daily blog for the Washington Post. And um, we had the good fortune to have John with us uh, for a year, uh, a while ago at the Reuters Institute, which is where he researched the paper that's on your desk. And I'd urge you not to read it at the moment, but while you're puzzling over the title, I mean, puzzle over the title rather than reading it. And when you leave the session, maybe have a look at it then, and then you'll work out the, the meaning of the title. 
Um, but you need to get some way into it before you work that one out. So do that over lunch rather than that. Uh, John's going to talk about what he's writing about in that book, but also about his experience and his and Washington Post experience of trying to engage with blogs and user-generated content. Jonathan Ford um, works for Reuters. Uh, Reuters is an organization well known for supplying news, reliable, independent, impartial news. Uh, Jonathan's got the unusual job of introducing comment into a traditional news organization. Not just comment, but also engaging with communities in terms of social media and user-generated content in a particular user community, that of financial journalists. Financial journalists are interested, interesting people because they both use the news a lot, but they also, in terms of their dealings in markets, also make the news in a very specific way, as some of us have found out to our cost in the last couple of years. Um, so that's our panel of three people here. I'm going to ask them to speak in that order for up to 10 minutes each, and then we're going to move, up, move on to questions um, in what looks like a rather crowded room. So, Richard, do you want to open up? David, thanks very much indeed. Um, so how have uh, social media and um, traditional news media interacted? What's been the impact of the one upon the other? And I suppose my headline, being a news person, would be that um, kind of familiar refrain that uh, I think the impact is overestimated in the short term and underestimated in the long term. Uh, and in relation to that, I think a lot of news organisations currently, including the BBC, are going through great turmoil and disruption and struggling with that, uh, not least at, uh, on the economics of it, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about at the end. Uh, but actually, sort of think they're getting the hang of it, they're adopting blogging, they're adopting more openness, they're getting comments, they're looking at new formats for programming for broadcasters, so they kind of think that they're absorbing social media to a, de a degree. But I actually think in the long term, uh, they, they've got only just gone a few steps down a much longer journey, in my personal view. This is a, a personal view, not a BBC view, if you can put it that way. That's the headline. Let me try and expand on that with, um, uh, if you'll forgive me, in a Twitter age four soundbite. So first soundbite is, um, we don't own the news anymore. Uh, we don't own the news anymore. It's a, it's a phrase which indicates that shift from gatekeeper to much more open access for the public to public space and public debate. Uh, and there's obviously a big, a big cultural change in that and all sorts of opportunity. And, and I'm sure all of us are familiar with that, the idea of that, that power shift, if you like, in, in, in uh, journalism, citizen journalism and access to the public space. Um, I think when you scratch below that headline principle, it gets a bit more complicated. So when we talk about citizen journalism, we quite often mean uh, a, a lot of very different things. Uh, we mean, for example, sending in uh, pictures and video to news organisations who use them. Uh, eyewitness uh, experience, sometimes it's e uh, emails of an eyewitness experience for, a, for whatever, something like that. Uh, and by and large, I think big news organisations have made a lot of progress in, in opening up to that. I mean, they've always used, they've always interviewed eyewitnesses, they've always used material from the public. It's now available on a much greater scale because of the technology and we've had to scale up how we handle that and so on. But by and large, that's being absorbed into the news gathering processes and the credit's being given and so on, and all that's gone quite well. But you know, that's only one part of what we mean by, by citizen journalism. I, I think that all of the, um, the opinion and the debate and the discussion that happens on blogs or happens on Twitter or wherever else, starting to get absorbed and, and the relationship between mainstream news and, and that social media space starting to integrate, starting to work out what that is. There's no reason from a news organization's point of view why that shouldn't be a very vibrant part of what they offer on, on radio. We've had radio phone-ins which have been a way of absorbing the opinions of the audience into programming and so on and giving access to the audience to programming. We've had that as a, as a format for decades. Uh, I don't really yet see the kind of social media equivalent of that. We try things, we have a program called World Have Your Say and so on which tries to absorb the opinion of what's happening in the web. I think it's got further to go. Uh, the web is a place where news is broken. Uh, again, I think mainstream media is, is uh, making some, some progress in there, but it's got a lot further to go. So Sky News has a Twitter correspondent who's scouting Twitter and finding out what's on there and discussing it and so on. Um, you know, you can go to Facebook where people are sharing you know, pictures and ideas and, and networking and so on. Um, but uh, I don't really see yet uh, a, a kind of fundamental use of 
the internet as a place, place to go and find news and uncover news. And you know, I suppose that the par there's a parallel session now, I think, about science, for example. Yeah. And in terms of science journalism, <coughs> the internet is fantastically important. And of course, if you're a science specialist, you know, you'll be using the internet and so on. But what about all the other, all the other specialists and all the other genre? I don't think, and I'm speaking absolutely about the BBC as much as about anything else, I don't yet feel that the potential uh, it has been fully exploited uh, there yet. And then finally, there's what we call, um, in my kind of quick construct here, what we call network journalism. And, and again, I'm sure uh, uh, most of you are familiar with the idea of that, that you use the expertise in the audience to inform and direct your journalism. And, you know, again, there's some sort of interesting experiments and there are some individual cases in, in big media of network journalism. But it's not something that's really established itself yet. And I think there is enormous potential there. Any, any topic, any subject, any event that uh, a mainstream news organization wants to report, the, the audience, people in the public, will know far more about it than they do. And if they can tap into that expertise and use it to drive their journalism, it can improve the quality of what they do and the relevance of what they do and so on. And there are some faltering experiments there, it seems to me, but, but that hasn't really yet taken, taken root. So, you know, uh, we don't own the news anymore. We've made some start in trying to understand how major news organizations can relate to the public differently. Uh, and there's been some, you know, quite interesting progress in, in some parts of that, but there's a lot more that could be done. The other part of that, of course, is a big cultural shift in attitude and mindset. And um, that brings me to the second soundbite, which is that transparency is the new objectivity. David Weinberger of uh, Berkman Center at Harvard uh, said that. And uh, I think very quickly what, what it means by that, objectivity is an idea behind I think, news organizations like Reuters or the BBC or the news pages of the Washington Post is really sort of a set of disciplines or tools or an approach uh, designed to de deliver journalism that people could trust, a high quality of journalism. Uh, and although that's still very important for certainly my organization, uh, in the new media age, uh, transparency is what delivers trust, perhaps even more than those journalistic disciplines. So for a, an organization like the BBC, it's increasingly important, not just that what we broadcast is accurate, fair, and, and all of those things, but that we can show people how we've arrived at those decisions and those judgments. People now are able not just to communicate to the news organization or the media, but they communicate between each other about the media. Uh, and they question what we're doing, and they don't understand sometimes what those judgments are, and they want to take issue with it perfectly legitimately. So for us, it is important to lift the bonnet on the news operation and show people how it works and why it works and why those judgments are made as much as it is to deliver the journalism itself. Uh, and that takes quite a big cultural shift. So news organizations, that we have an editor's blog, and you know, newspapers have uh, readers' editors, and there are kind of access programs on television and so on. And that's a start towards that kind of transparency and that kind of cultural shift. But I personally believe it's going to have to go a great deal further. I, I talked to an editor at, at work and say, said to him, you know, the more often you're on a program like Newswatch, sort of access program which questions the judgments and so on, the more often you're on there, the better it is because you'll be able to explain what you do and people will trust you more. And he was still in the mindset that he said, no, 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 if I ever go on there, it means I've made a mistake and it's terrible. Whatever I do, I must try and stay off it. And that shift that says, no, actually, be open. Go on there, talk about it, drop your guard, you know, is a big flip for a lot of people who've worked in, in main news organizations for a long time. So on that cultural front, transparency is new objectivity. We started to take a few steps down the road again. I think it's got an awful lot further to go. Third sound bite, um, information is not journalism. Uh, I just invented that one, but I quite like it. I'm use it more often. Uh, information is not journalism. Um, so people say, oh, I, you know, the evangelists say, I don't need the BBC, I don't need newspapers, I get my news from Twitter in the morning. Well, you can get a lot of things from Twitter, and I, I'm on there and I use it. You can get gossip, you can get uh, links, you can get um, marketing, you can get lobbying, you can get campaigning, you can get debate, you can get discussion. But in my view, you don't get journalism, because I think journalism can take all of those things and do something with it. Journalism needs some discipline, needs a judgment applied to it. Journalism needs verification. It uh, requires some analysis, some explanation, some context. That's not the same as information. And I think social media is fantastic at opening up the information flow, the information stream to anybody, and provides exponentially huge, hugely more information uh, swirling around in the public space. But journalism needs to take that and do something with it, and it's not the same thing. Uh, and uh, I think the good, that's good news in, 
the long term because when people say actually journalism's dying and it's going to go on the rest of it, actually that's the value of what news organisations do is in the application of that judgement and in that analysis and that explanation and so on. And actually in a world in which there's more and more information, the value of that uh, should increase. Now at the minute we're in a, a very sort of volatile period of disruption and so on and I don't think that value has come through. Uh, or even recognised, or certainly not even Rupert Murdoch has yet found a way to monetize that. But I personally think that in spite of all of this disruption and all of this change, the basic fundamentals of journalism, the need for verification, for accuracy, for analysis, for explanation, are absolutely unchanged, and if anything, more important than ever. So that's what makes me an optimist about the future of journalism in the new world, rather than a pessimist. And then very finally, I'll offer one more soundbite. This one's not quite as easy. Um, uh, if you find yourself in competition with the internet, find a way out. If you find yourself in competition with the internet, find a way out. Dave Weiner in the US uh, used that. He's a, um, a kind of developer and, and a pundit and blogger and so on. Let me say a couple of things about that idea. Firstly, we should note the assumption that the current characteristics of the internet will endure. Collaboration, openness, uh, the link culture, uh, ports of search engine, all of those things. It assumes all of that is the way the internet will work. Uh, and it may not. Uh, it may not because Rupert Murdoch might succeed in erecting barriers and everyone else will follow and suddenly it'll all be fenced off and the link culture won't work and it won't be open and collaborative. I don't think that'll happen personally, but, you know, maybe. Uh, or the internet may change fundamentally as the next billion and then the next billion and then the next billion users come on, as we discussed in the last, last session. Uh, or it may be that more government filtering and censorship or parallel commercial networks you know, there's all sorts of things that could change the way we see the internet today. However, let's assume for the moment that the current characteristics continue. What does that mean for news organisations? And I think incredibly challenging on the economic and the financial front, clearly. And that's the biggest issue that all of us in mainstream media. I, mean, I work for BBC, but half of what I run is commercial as well, BBC World News and the uh, international internet site. And you know, all of us are struggling to find a way to make that work. But I think we will find a model, because I do personally, and it's a leap of faith, and all of us are making a leap of faith, believe there is a value uh, in professional journalism in what we do. And I think a model, and it may not be anything we're familiar with yet, I'm confident that something will come through this period uh, of disruption. But you know, that idea of the way the internet works affects uh, very fundamentals of, of, of how journalism has worked for, for kind of living memory. So distribution, you know, I, 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 newspapers will endure, television and radio will endure, uh, uh, as David said, but it, you know, I do read newspapers from all over the world on my phone, on my way into work. I don't need to buy them. Uh, you know, all those basics of, of distribution under the economics are absolutely challenged. And let me throw out one final thought, which again, my colleagues sometimes think I'm mad when I say this. It seems to me that in this kind of increasingly interconnected and interdependent world, the very basis of how you gather news uh, it's shifting very fundamentally. So, you know, the old model, which has been decades old, that um, you have a bureau or you send someone from London or New York to go to a place that they don't know very well and talk to a few people and come back and tell you what they found. You know, that's a model that, you know, I've grown up with and I've worked with and it's been great fun, but in a world of interconnection uh, uh, and in, a, in an ever interdependent world with all the kind of technology and the network the capability we have, it increasingly feels like a really stupid way to do it. Uh, and actually, the, the potential of network journalism and a very different approach, it seems to me, is inevitable. And you know, I'm not saying that the foreign correspondent is going to disappear tomorrow uh, or will disappear totally, but I think the very fundamentals of how we gather news, as well as how we distribute it, are going to be questioned over the next five to ten years. And that's where I started saying you know, we overestimate in the short term and underestimate in the long term. Uh, as the impact of, of digital technology works its way through news organisations, it's going to continue to be even more disruptive than I think we've seen so far. <coughs> and my personal view is that that will impact on absolutely the fundamentals of how we gather news, how we aggregate it, how we distribute it, and of course how we pay for it. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. <coughs> well, I'm going to turn to John, John Kelly. Um, David, I liked your metaphor with the canal, uh, the canal boats <laughs> and the coal. Although I would, I would say that coal is coal is coal. There's no such thing as citizen coal. Um, and, and so as applied to journalism, um, it's a diff, like a different sort of coal 
is coming and people can burn different things now. And um, as far as the canal goes, it's, they're still around. When I was a teenager here, I remember taking a vacation where my father rented a canal boat and we traveled on the canals and went through the locks. But the people who were on the canals were le you know, retirees and it was a leisure sort of thing. And if canals are newspapers, that is possibly one way newspapers will go, which is as a sort of boutique thing for people who, who don't want to get nuclear power in their homes or whatever, but want to, oh, this is kind of fun, it's kind of old fashioned, this newspaper, like I want a canal boat. Um, but uh, that's something else. Um, I write a column that's 800 words long now, so it's very hard for me to think in anything more than 800 words, so you'll appreciate how painful this was. And when I was looking at it on the table compared with the other ones that the Reuters Institute published, it's like a third as big. It's like, oh man. But um, anyway, my basic premise in this is um, that citizen journalism came about because of two things, technology and uh, a sort of mistrust of the media. But um, what I wanted to start with today, and it was Richard's um, sort of fourth point about the economic climate in, in which we're working. And when I think back to the worries that journalists had three or four years ago about citizen journalism, and that maybe in blogs and maybe that some people have about Twitter now, um, that this was somehow threatening the fourth estate. I'm struck by how naive that sounds now, how clueless, because newspapers fail, uh, have failed you know, since then, not because of they used too much citizen journalism or not enough citizen journalism, but because their circulations dropped, their advertising dried up, and they just were not viable business entities anymore. So while this is quite literally and rightly an academic exercise here today. I think it's important to have that uh, fact in the back of our heads. Also, I should say that I don't, though I've talked with lots of people in the Post who work much more closely with this stuff than I do, this is not what I do with the Post. I do a very traditional daily column. I also do a blog, and I, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and that sort of thing, but, but I'm not at the sort of bleeding edge of this stuff. Um, but with the basic question of, of things like uh, blogs and, and how that's changed the media and then getting on to social media, I would say, yes, you know, the longer that you live with something, uh, the better that you know it, whether it's like a spouse or whatever. But um, for in, in the case of blogs, I remember when I was here two, two years ago, um, the journalists I met here, the older journalists especially, would say two things. One was, American newspapers are different from British newspapers because you have fact checkers at American newspapers. And we don't have fact checkers at British newspapers. And the truth is we don't have fact checkers at American newspapers. I don't know how that came out. Uh, I think everybody thinks of the New Yorker, which does have fact checkers. But you know we print corrections every day in the Washington Post. And sometimes those corrections are wrong. So that tells you <laughs> that we don't have fact checkers. Um, and the other thing, when we would talk about blogs, or when people were talking about blogs, people would uh, would sometimes say, oh, you mean like the Drudge Report. And of course, the Drudge Report isn't a blog. It's an aggregator of content. And occasionally, even what he calls original reporting is basically somebody else's reporting that he's got leaked to him, and he puts it up there. So um, that showed a misunderstanding, I think, of, that, that wouldn't happen today, because I think people know what things are about. And things like Guido Fox and Ian Dale and all that has made it much more obvious what those things are. Um, does the mainstream media see blogs as threats and now social media as threats in some way? Um, I don't think so. I think it sees them as competitors, uh, but not necessarily competitors in a journalistic sense. There, there, there are some that do compete. Uh, we see them as a competitor in an audience sense. You know, The Huffington Post competes with the Washington Post, not with its journalism, though it, it has a few notable exceptions where it has done journalism. Um, but with the audience it brings to its website, a, a, you know, a potentially finite audience that we need just as much as they need uh, you know, for business reasons. Um, so to jump away from, from blogs a second and go to social media, as important as social media is as a journalistic tool, it's, a, it's important as an audience building tool to the Post. Um, I guess Nick Newman's paper is going to be published soon by the Reuters Institute. And I just read that, and he said that 8% of the, 
of the Telegraph's web traffic comes from Twitter, Facebook, Dig, things like that. 8%, that's not an inconsiderable number. I don't have precise numbers for the post, um, and I, they probably wouldn't let me say, tell, me what, t tell you what they were anyway if they didn't give me. But I did hear that the, that the traffic from social media sites like that now rivals the traffic from Drudge that, that we get. And that's pretty impressive because Drudge used to be, that was the thing that editors were desperate to have was a link on Drudge because it really drove your traffic on that day. So now you know, we are exploring uh, social media as a way to drive audience numbers. Uh, as far as using it for journalism, it's really early days at the Post. And like a lot of American papers, we're really behind British counterparts like The Guardian and The Telegraph. Uh, some of our reporters, Twitter, some of our writers and columnists blog. Uh, we, you know, we have Facebook fan pages for different things, although there are discussions about now is it better to have a presence on, on Facebook or to have something on our own site so we can control and capture those numbers more than diluting them from Facebook. Uh, through Facebook. Um, we've brought some bloggers into the fold with, you know, who've had successful blogs on the outside, or we've anointed citizen journalists to do blogs, especially in hyper-local areas, which is an a expression that, you know, about a year, year and a half ago became sort of hot. We, we did not really have a success with our hyper-local experiment, which was in a suburban county near Maryland called Loudoun County. But it was not for journalistic reasons. I think that, that we saw it as a journalistic success, this very local coverage of local schools and sporting leagues and churches and things like that. Um, and in fact, the audience was growing still by the time we pulled the plug. But we could not sell ads for it, or we did not sell ads for it. So that gets back to that backdrop I was talking about. Uh, now what about in the other direction? And that is putting the work of citizens in the paper under the banner of the Washington Post. Um, again, we're, we're not as far advanced as, as some of the papers over here. We've done a few crowdsourcing things, but they've been more feature-y type things. We haven't done an MP's expenses type of thing like The Guardian did. Um, you know, we've done things connected with Obama's inaugural so that you know, you're on the mall, you're taking pictures, um, or you're seeing things, and Twitter that, and we'll sort of aggregate those. We, um, we do something with sports, uh, you know, a lot of athletes tweet now, but, but also a lot of fake athletes tweet, celebrities. <laughs> uh, not that they're fake athletes, that, but they're, they're pretending to be that athlete. And so we have done, um, we aggregate verified National Football League players, and we uh, post their tweets. So we've got like 200 who we know this is actually this athlete, and so you don't have to look for him or guess whether it's real or not. And we call that uh, YA Twiddle. And you probably have no idea why we call it YA Twiddle. <laughs> YA Tittle was a famous quarterback in America. So with Twitter, you just add a W to anything and you've got, um, suddenly you're cool. Um, <laughs> does the media's rush into blogs and social media cause us to sacrifice journalistic quality? Um, Certainly what they call the news cycle has sped up. I had, was talking with a post editor, and he used the expression corrected tweet. You know, well, we have to get used to the corrected tweet. We send something out quickly, and then we send the other one. Oh, actually, that was wrong. Um, I think that what Richard said about transparency is a new objectivity. That, that's good advice. We just have to be better as journalists at labeling things. We have heard this. You know, these are the terms by which we are making this public, and, and that's going to be important. Um, I, but I think it's also important to, to remember that most of the sort of infamous failures of modern journalism were not necessarily the result of being too fast. Um, they were simply the result of being too wrong. Newspapers can spend months on a story and still have to publish lengthy corrections and occasionally corrections to those corrections. Um, and the problem with American newspapers' behavior you know, during the lead up to the Iraq war wasn't that the Washington Post tweeted, Saddam has WMD, 
or Judy Miller tweeted, curveball says there's yellow cake, LOL. Um, <laughs> it's because we just weren't curious enough or you know, we weren't doing the basic blocking and tackling that needed to be done before that war. Um, now, social media, I think, can solve some of the problems that, that have sort of risen over the last few years. You know, we, we have a tremendous, not a problem, but there's lots of debate about comments on stories. And you know, The Guardian gets hundreds of comments. And I, I frankly, I find the level of discourse there higher than we have on our comments. So that might tell you how low our comments uh, you mean they higher just, in terms of numbers or the intensity well, of the views expressed? <coughs> but all, all three of those things. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and, you know, as Facebook just takes over, um, you know, and that's predicated on your real name and you want to be associated with your real name with friends. And now that more newspapers are linking up with Facebook Connect and doing things where your social media uh, persona is across platforms, if Facebook is the way you're doing it and that's your real name, maybe that means your real name is going to be on your comment and maybe because of that you're, you're going to think a little bit while you're writing your comment and posting your comment. Um, of course, being, you know, using your real name didn't stop Kanye West from being rude at the Video Music Awards um, the other day. Uh, maybe we can talk later about some of the legal issues if people have questions about that. Um, but, but one point uh, I wanted to make is that when it comes to the citizen journalism stuff and, and, and using uh, you know, what, what the potential is for this uh, and also what the venality of the mainstream media is, uh, you know, allegedly, I, I wish the rhetoric on both sides would tone down a little bit. And that is that the claims made by both sides were a little bit um, more modest, so that I am willing for newspapers and journalists not to um, be so strident in our, you know, democracy will fail if we fail, uh, which seems a little overheated. If on the other side, um, you know, people uh, would refrain from saying uh, social media and, and user-generated user content, citizen journalism, will save everything democracy will rise like a grand uh, you know, city of gold on a hill or whatever. Um, but I'm just about out of time. Thank you. Thanks, John. Jonathan. Thank you. Um, well, John, in his, uh, his excellent book, um, Red then. Kayaks and Hidden Gold, which I, I can uh, personally say is uh, the perfect length, having read it <laughs> on my lobby outside, <laughs> makes one point which about citizen this journalism. This is the Twitter of papers. <laughs> <laughs> it makes one, very, one point about citizen journalism, how it was forged effectively in a series of um, uh, disasters, if you like, or certain aspects of it. Uh, 2001, the tsunami in 2004, and then the London bombings in 2005 had an impact on the media in the UK. I think, you know, how uh, the social media blogs have developed in the financial space is sort of, it, it's been slightly different in the sense that the disaster is really, is, is really come more recently in the financial sphere and has probably, so therefore the impact of um, social media, which I'd say started to make itself felt really in the US, different again because it's been led by the US rather than the UK I think, started to felt, make itself felt in the US in, in, the, in the wake of the dot-com bubble. Um, but now has really been given a lot of momentum by what has really happened over the last two years. Um, I mean, I joined uh, Reuters relatively recently to set up a commentary service, and one of the things which I was interested to do was to explore the idea of, of taking Reuters into an area they hadn't been in before, which was opinion, <coughs> opinion blogs on finance. Um, this um, took Reuters a long way away from its comfort zone, um, for a number of reasons. One, you know, traditionally Reuters um, had been a, essentially behind a paywall, a paid, closed site, offering valuable information to people um, in return for subscriptions, whereas blogs are clearly free and open, so you were giving away something of, of, of value for nothing. Secondly, um, finance blogs offered opinion, and Reuters had always been very much into fact and indeed had a series of trust principles 
which were dedicated to upholding the accuracy and freedom from bias of its content. Now, it's, it's not easy to publish opinion if you start from the principle that you're not going to be at all biased. So it therefore <coughs> it took quite a, a, a major leap for them to, to, to go from one space to the next. And lastly, Reuters has, a like any organization, I'm sure it's the same as the BBC, with an enormous number of journalists scattered over the world, nearly 3,000, has a very structured editing process. And the idea of getting to grips with the sort of editing that opinion requires is, is just a completely different sort of journalism, in a way, to the sort that it had traditionally been involved in. Um, now, um, why, you might ask, is Reuters, was Reuters particularly interested in getting to the, into this sort of alien space? And I think it goes back to the, the question of the way in which the financial media had evolved over the past five or six years, but accelerating, as I say, with the financial crisis. Um, I think that the social media has, is, is now having a major impact, particularly in the States, on the way that finance is reported. And, and clearly that financial audience is a core audience for Reuters, and it therefore wanted to continue to stay in touch with it and not to, if you like, lose um, its contact. Um, I think blogs, blogs in the financial space have really gained, gained traction with readers for a Similar, similar sorts of reasons to the, to the ones the other sp speakers have, have, have referred to. One, I think there's been a, there's a distrust of the mainstream media, the mainstream financial media, I think, be partly because it had failed to spot <coughs> initially the tech bubble in the United States and then later on the credit bubble that we've had more recently. Um, <coughs> the fact that, I mean, I think this is probably more specific comment to the financial media than the more mainstream media, it used more colorful and emotive language, um, whereas a lot of mainstream financial journalism was rather gray and sort of technocratic in tone. Um, and lastly, I think, and, and, and probably the most important thing in terms of reaching a sophisticated financial audience, because this is, this is the point that, if you like, worries newspapers and organizations like Reuters, is it wasn't just reaching the wider public, it was reaching their core audience of people who were sophisticated users of the financial media, it was that the blogs provided what I call sort of wonky journalism that threw up generally, gen genuinely interesting and important ideas which the mainstream media didn't seem to cater for. Um, and it's also worth thinking about you know, the reasons that readers had become less enamored of the mainstream financial media and therefore left this door open. Um, and I think there are three here that I would point to. One is that newspapers, especially the, the mainstream newspapers in their finance pages, didn't really invest very much in reporting financial news, um, meaning that reporters were often ill-trained and not really up to the job that they were being asked to do. It's often seen as a sort of entry point for people who wanted to go on and report mainstream news, a sort of apprenticeship which you served in a newspaper, and therefore effectively the journalists who were being employed to report on the sector were often those who were least able to understand its ramifications of what it was doing. Um, I think a second was the vast and growing gulf in salaries between those employed in finance and those writing about it, which essentially meant that anyone with an interest or aptitude in finance went and did it rather than reported on it because it was economically irrational to do so. <laughs> Um, and lastly, I think that to, to, to differentiate themselves in the way they reported financial news, I think newspapers and other media organizations focused on getting scoops. And, but what's important is the sort of scoops that they were chasing with what I call sort of mergers and acquisitions tip-offs. Um, obtaining these sort of stories required journalists to cultivate the people who they were reporting on and get close to them. And it was that sort of closeness which led in, I, th I think, to what people in the wider world saw as a, a sort of agency capture of financial journalism by the industry it was reporting on. And indeed with, <coughs> with hedge funds, you know, um, who are very sophisticated users of the media. It was interesting in the last few years that hedge funds started re recruiting journalists not to be hedge fund managers, but essentially to write stories which could be planted in the press. So there was a sort of, it had become a very sophisticated playback system. Um, and, um, and I think for all those reasons, um, 
and, uh, and also the sort of other ones that people have referred to, such as the, the perception that journalists, financial journalists, were not really getting out of the office and finding out what was going on in the wider world, were not sort of in the United States um, necessarily um, going to branch banks in California or Texas and finding out the sort of mortgages, the inappropriate mortgage products that people were buying, which, and therefore asking how on earth could these products be sold in this way. Um, I think all, all it, for all those reasons, there was a lot, loss of trust. And that trust, if you like, that loss of trust became sort of critical in a way. It, it had been building up for a number of years, but became more critical when the credit bubble burst. Um, of course, the bloggers didn't gain ground simply because the mainstream was poor. Some of it was indeed very good. They also gained ground because they had something to contribute to the debate. And I think this, once again, is a sort of, this is an interesting feature of the way that the social media um, has developed in the financial sphere. We're not really here talking about citizen journalists in the sense of people recording things on their camera phones or just contributing sort of uh, an opinion from um, wherever it is or observing an event that's going on around them. The sort of, the sort of, the way in which the social media and the financial sphere developed was, it's, it's more like the sort of Islamic clergy in a way. You had a series of people who was perceived to have knowledge and, um, and ideas which were worth listening to, who through all those sort of uh, processes of recommendation started to acquire an audience. Um, and the sort of people who rose to the top were not sort of, not really citizens. They were sort of people like Nouriel Rabini and Paul Krugman, who basically, and other financiers, and particularly in the United States, financiers, who in a sense had made their money in, in Wall Street or the city and became motivated by a desire to explain to the wider world um, what on earth they'd been up to. Um, and, and the chicanery they saw in their own industry. So it was a it was a, a, a well informed core, if you like, of citizen journalists that started to dominate the debate. Um, of, of course, you, you know these were also people who were contributing um, highly edited pieces to newspapers often. Um, but there was something clearly more engaging about the sort of relatively raw, unedited um, engagement. That that, that meant their blogs chimed very much with readers. Um, and there were also attractive renegades against what was seen as a stifling consensus. Um, you have to remember that in the last year before the, the, in the last years before the bubble burst, the academic economist community in Britain and America had been largely bought up by the financial world, um, endowing chairs and so forth. And, and therefore, um, there was a sort of, um, there was a sort of, people like Rubini, if you like, stepped outside the consensus, which, which gave them a clear, made them interesting and, and credible. Um, but, but clearly what has, what has sort of brought this whole thing to, to, to a head has been the bursting of the bubble and the way in which that story played out from 2006, 2007 onwards. Um, what was very interesting is the way that the bloggers were often the first to see the next twist in the story and explain it before the mainstream media had even got onto it. And highly paid journalists at financial newspapers or other organizations were just left puffing in their wake. And, and blogs even started to critique the performance of the mainstream media, which was a sort of interesting development. Um, there's a blog in the United States called Calculated Risk, which um, wrote a lot about the mortgage crisis. And there was a story, I think it was in the Washington Post, which was uh, probably in about 2007, which was where the reporter basically um, reported on a story of a man who'd taken out a, a mortgage in the US, which was clearly inappropriate. And the whole, the sort of basis of the story was arguing, you know, this, 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 these, these products have been <coughs> missold to people who are too sort of stupid to understand what they actually are. And, um, this blog, Calculated Risk, went through the story forensically and pointed out that the journalist had completely misdescribed the whole product and, and showed that indeed it wasn't merely uh, the sort of, uh, you know, the sort of, um, the, 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 the purchaser of this mortgage who failed to understand what uh, was going on, but indeed the journalist who was sent to cover the story had clearly 
not got a clue as to what, um, what was actually happening. And that, that um, and, and, um, and I think that that sort of thing is, is something which, which clearly has sort of uh, changed perceptions in some ways. Um, I think that, uh, I think that Reuters, basically, why is Reuters interested in blogging there? I mean, fundamentally, I think it's interested in it because it can see the value of establishing communities, and it's doing so already around some of its other businesses, setting up um, communities with very specific um, users who require specialist professional information, um, offering them specific sort of trade news and information. Um, an opinion blog, I think, offers a, a, an opportunity to do the same thing, but in a less specialist field. And it has an added draw of being able to call on Reuters' sort of powerful news and data services. Um, I think there's also um, a race on, really, in the financial sphere to create a sort of online portal onto the internet. If there is all this interesting, valuable information out there that people want access to, um, there's still um, the opportunity, I think, that, and this is certainly what I think you know, the main, a lot of the mainstream financial in, in, um, newspapers and um, information providers see to, to be the sort of portal into this world of information to aggregate it, a bit like the sort of Huffington Post. Um, I think the Financial Times is already pursuing a similar strategy with a, with a thing called Alphaville. The Wall Street Journal is doing the same, and I think, and, and, and that is also one of the reasons that Reuters is motivated to look in this area. And, um, and lastly, you know, on the, on the branding front, I think there are advantages too, which is if you're, an, if you're like Reuters, essentially in, in background, a wholesaler of news. Um, its brand, therefore, is well known, but has limited resonate, resonance with the wider public or personality. Um, having this sort of product allows you to project a personality onto the, onto the, onto the whole thing. Um, but I agree with everyone else. I think you know that this is a, this is all still at an experimental stage. It's very hard to see how you know it's possible to make blogging pay, um, and it's not a cost-free exercise to aggregate <coughs> information and curate, and also to select, which is essentially the value of the aggregation process to steer people towards the most interesting content. Um, people may lose interest because of the vast profusion of financial information. Um, and also the mainstream media may get its act together and the, the picture, may, picture may change again. Um, but I guess that's, that's, that's all I've really got Thank to say. You. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, just one, one question. Do you, you're a professional journalist. Yeah. Do you feel threatened by all these people doing this stuff for free that's better than what your colleagues have been doing over the last 10 years? Um, I, think, I, I, I think it's actually complementary. I do agree with the others. I think it's complementary. I think that, I mean, I employ bloggers, and it's, a, it's basically um, what is clear is that um, it's not really possible to make a living even where you have a, where you have a large... I mean, logically, if, you, if a blogger could make a living, they would disintermediate someone like Reuters completely. They wouldn't want to have anything to do with it because it, would, it simply would act as a constraint on your ability to have more fun and to make a perfectly adequate living. Um, the, but but it's, clearly, it's clearly not um, possible to do that. And so, therefore, the function, I think, is... I mean, it, in, in the financial space, is it's, it, I would see it more as a sort of showcase for people who are doing other things. It's essentially a, a showcase for people who have um, businesses to run, people who have who want to make a, a living as a journalist and a commentator, but don't necessarily want to be directly employed by a media organisation. But essentially, it's a way of showing what they're doing, and 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 um, and getting it out to the widest possible readership. Okay. Thank you.